This video was brought to you by NordVPN. On Sunday, 1.3 million Estonians went to the polls to elect a new government. Unsurprisingly, this election campaign was dominated by the war in Ukraine and the related cost of living crisis in Estonia. Broadly speaking, incumbent Prime Minister Kaja Kallis promised to continue with her government's generous support for Ukraine, while the opposition parties instead wanted to focus more on supporting the Estonians through the cost of living crisis. In the end, Kallis won a healthy plurality and will probably remain as Prime Minister. But in this video, we wanted to look at how the election actually panned out, why Kallis won and what this means for Europe and Ukraine. Before we get into the results, let's start with a brief overview of how politics and elections work in Estonia. Estonia is a parliamentary republic with both a prime minister and a president. The president, whose role is mostly ceremonial, albeit with some reserved powers, is elected every five years. While Estonia also has a unicameral parliament, known as the Rijikagu, which has 101 members. Members of the Rijikagu are elected for a term of four years by a party list proportional representation system, which means that the number of seats a party wins in an election is proportional to the number of votes that party receives. As such, the country is divided into 12 multi-member electoral districts, and each constituency is represented by between 6 and 14 members of parliament, depending on the population of the constituency at hand. Now, the electoral system itself is actually pretty complicated, but in practice, it's essentially a proportional system with a 5% threshold, which means that a party needs to win 5% of the vote nationally to win any seats in Parliament. Estonia also utilises an electronic voting system, which it's had since the 2005 municipal elections, where they use government-issued state ID cards in order to validate their online votes. Although only 3% of voters voted online in the 2007 election, that number had reached 44% by the last election in 2019. In fact, we've made a couple of videos on this topic in the past, and in one of them we even visited Estonia and I got my own e-residency pass. Each of those are linked in the description if you want to know more. Anyway, because Estonia uses a proportional representation system, coalition governments in the country are the norm. Now, the ruling coalition has actually chopped and changed a fair bit since the last election in 2019. But since July 2022, Estonia has been ruled by a centrist three-party coalition composed of the Liberal Centre-Right Reform Party, led by Prime Minister Kaja Kallis, the Christian Conservative Isma Party, and the centre-left Social Democratic Party. Now, the previous coalition, which was sort of a grand coalition of the Reform Party and the second biggest party in Estonia, the Centre Party, fell apart last June over an education language reform bill that would have got rid of all Russian-speaking education from the fourth grade onwards, from the age of 10 by the year 2024. For context, due to its Soviet past, about 25% of Estonia's population are Russian-speaking, and the country currently has two parallel education systems, with Estonian-speaking schools and Russian-speaking schools. The Centre Party, who have traditionally represented Estonia's Russian-speaking minority, and used to have formal ties with Putin's United Russia Party, which refused to back the bill, which prompted the government collapse. That's not just some interesting trivia about the former coalition. You kind of have to understand this to get Estonian politics at the moment. While most Estonians are very pro-Ukraine, and Kallis is a remarkably popular politician in her own right, there are a significant Russian-speaking minority who are generally a bit more sympathetic towards Russia. Anyway, the two major themes of this election were national security and the cost of living. That's because relative to its GDP, Estonia has been the biggest supporter of Ukraine anywhere in the world, and the country has taken on an enormous number of Ukrainian migrants. Kallis' government has also banned Russian migrants, taken steps to ban Russian-speaking schools, and removed Soviet-era monuments from the country, which hasn't gone down that well with Estonia's Russian-speaking population, 
or certain opposition parties, notably the Centre Party and the ultra-conservative EKRE Party. And when it comes to the second major issue, the cost of living, Estonia's decision to stop importing Russian gas early last year pushed energy prices up over 200% and contributed to Estonia's exceptionally high inflation rate. Again, there's some disagreement between the governing coalition and the opposition parties over how much the state should borrow in order to support Estonians through the crisis, with the Reform Party being generally quite fiscally conservative and parties like EKRE arguing for much more spending. So, with the dividing line set, what actually happened on Sunday? Well, as expected, the Reform Party won the most votes, which means that Kallas will almost certainly continue as the country's prime minister. Assuming that she can negotiate a new coalition then, this means that Estonia will continue with its current level of support for Ukraine. And additionally, Kallas has said that she wants to increase defence spending to 3% of GDP. Now, this is obviously good news for Ukraine, but also for European unity more generally, Despite Putin's best efforts, so far pro-Ukraine politicians around the world have fared pretty well at the ballot box, and Estonia is yet another data point in this trend. However, the other thing worth noting was the strong showing by the EKRE, otherwise known as the Estonian National Conservative Party. In many ways, the EKRE are your bog-standard European populists. They're avowedly Eurosceptic, they don't like green policies, and they don't like anything LGBTQ plus either. The party's leader, Mart Helmer, has even described Tallinn's Pride event as a parade of perverts, and said that he wants to see homosexual and multicultural propaganda taken out of schools. However, what makes them more interesting is their stance on Ukraine and their appeal among ethnic Russians. That's because until quite recently, EKRE used to be an Estonian nationalist party who were essentially opposed to the presence of any ethnic minority, including Russians in Estonia. However, over the last couple of years, EKRE has started appealing to ethnic Russians in Estonia, largely because ethnic Russians are generally more conservative than ethnic Estonians. And this trend has been accelerated by EKRE's stance on Ukraine. While the party's leadership claims to support Ukraine, EKRE opposed sending any more arms to the country or taking in any more Ukrainian migrants. Helmer also made headlines in April when he claimed that Ukrainian refugees would bring aids to Estonia because they'd end up as prostitutes. Anyway, EKRE have become remarkably popular among ethnic Russians, many of whom have turned away from the centre party. And this is one of the reasons that they've fared pretty well in this election. Conversely, this partly explains the centre party's relatively poor showing in this election. Although they probably weren't helped by the fact that last time they were in government, they were brought down by a corruption scandal. Anyway, Kallas has ruled out a coalition with EKRE, so they're unlikely to have much influence on government policy, but their rise will definitely be worth keeping an eye on. All in all, this is a good result for Ukraine and Estonia's stability, but it's probably also true that headlines about Kallas' victory obfuscate a fair bit of political churn going on under the surface in Estonia, which will be worth keeping an eye on. Something else worth keeping an eye on is your own personal and financial safety online. A couple of years ago, I was a victim of identity theft, and I only found out when a letter from the court came through my door saying that I owed a bunch of money to a broadband company for an address I'd never even lived at. After a bunch of legal back and forth, I was forced to pay the money that I allegedly owed just to try and make the problem go away. But from then on, I was determined to make sure that I wasn't caught out again. And as such, I took a number of steps, including signing up for NordVPN. Now, you surely already know that NordVPN is the world's fastest virtual private network. But you might not know that they have a whole suite of threat protection features too. In fact, NordVPN's threat protection shields you from all kinds of dangerous things online, blocking malware, trackers, and malicious ads to help prevent you from falling victim to any of these scams or phishing attacks. 
not only that, they also have a dark web monitoring service. So even if your data were to fall into the wrong hands, they'd scour the dark web to notify you when someone shares, leaks, or sells your details. Hopefully meaning that you'd find out what was going on before a court order lands on your doorstep. Now, ultimately, this isn't a fun thing to think about, but trust me, it's a whole lot less fun when it becomes a reality. Also, it's not just other people that this happens to. I hope you'll agree that I'm a reasonably smart person, and I did a computer science degree, and I still got got. So, click the link in the description or go to nordvpn.com forward slash TLDR to get a huge discount on their two-year plan. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, you've got nothing to lose. So thanks for your support and make sure you click the link in the description.